It's obvious that um, Ukrainian diaspora in North America, which is the most powerful section of the Ukrainian diaspora in the world, uh, cannot compete with the millions, maybe billions, of dollars thrown at um, PR and um, what Russians and call political technology, PR and, and other ways of including bribery of European politicians. We simply can't compete with that. Um, the Russians are, are doing a, 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 a massive ideological and disinformation campaign reminiscent of what took place um, prior to the onset of detente in the 1970s. So we simply can't compete with the kind of huge amounts of money they're throwing at, um, for example, Russia Today TV, which uh, maybe even has a budget bigger than the BBC. At the same time, uh, this doesn't mean to say we have to sit on our laurels and not do much. One of the, uh, or one of the many aspects of what has come out of um, the conflicts in Ukraine, the Euromaidan and the war in eastern Ukraine, the Crimea, is the weakness of our PR response um, to these developments in the international arena. Now these are not something that suddenly appeared. These have historical background to them. And they can be construed in a number of different ways. For one thing, the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States and Canada, this is not a purely Canadian issue, um, never invested in contemporary issues. Um, of all the huge amounts of money that was collected and, investment and invested in academic centers and academic projects, whether it's Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, Columbia University more recently, uh, whether it's the Yatsik program to translate the Hrushevsky history of Ukraine, all 11 volumes, or whether it's the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies or the Chair of Ukrainian Studies in Toronto. None of these institutions and projects had anything to do with contemporary Ukraine. I'm the first person to be working at Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies who has a a research grant from an American Ukrainian foundation, uh, Ukrainian Studies Fund, to work on contemporary Ukraine. One recent um, center that deals with contemporary Ukraine is the University of Ottawa. It's not the most prestigious university in Canada, um, and it's Francophone as well as Anglophone. Um, they do do some um, some activities on contemporary Ukraine. But nevertheless, Dominic Carell, who's a chairholder, is rarely seen in the TV and on radio uh, defending Ukraine, to the extent that we would like uh, maybe Ukrainian diaspora to do so, encountering Russian propaganda and disinformation. So we have a scarcity of, of actual human being resources, people who are experts on politics, on economics, on international relations. So what, what, what does that mean? Well, it's meant that some institutions have not actually got involved in, um, in the media um, field, not, not, have not uh, responded positively to requests for interviews on TV and radio. And one here is thinking of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, which seems to have been very blasé about dealing with the media. But that's, just, that's, that's the Hury Institute in general. If you, if you have friends who live in Boston, they are blasé even towards the Ukrainian Hromada in, in Boston, never mind towards the, the media. Um, I mean, they are a, an extreme example of ivory tower academics. Um, in other areas, people have gone to TV and radio, but these are people who are academic experts on 18th century, 17th century Ukraine, Cossack issues. I mean, how are they supposed to know anything about, for example, um, the realist question in international relations, or countering views such as those of Professor Mearsheimer, who kind of talks about the, the need for Ukraine to, to accept the fact it's in within, within Russia's sphere of influence and to forego any, any uh, attempt to join the EU and NATO. So we have very few. One of the most surprising, but not, not completely surprising aspects of this, is the, the community associated with Oun Saban Bandera, whether it's Liga um, here or elsewhere. 
Um, I grew up in Britain in a community dominated by this organization, and they've always had at the same time as having the, the most members, the most resources in terms of finances, they've been extremely antagonistic towards becoming involved in the academic world. Um, partly because they don't trust those academics, they think they um, can't control them, can't, can't control the output that they, they produce. So they haven't invested in academic centres at the same time as complaining about the products that come out of academia, such as, for example, the works of people like John Paul Himke and others. Um, and Mr. Ru uh, Mr. Rudling, Professor Rudling, Professor Umland, who write about Ukrainian nationalism. They complain, but don't do anything to counter this. Even when um, individuals such as Professor Magotchi is happy to take, a, for his chair of Ukrainian studies, to take a grant from, say, Liga, to create a research endowment to, to, to research Ukrainian nationalism, to give an alternative viewpoint to the a revision review of the Himkas, the, the Umlands, and the, and the Rudlings. But that's, again, not happened. We just have criticism. And that community is also, surprisingly, not invested in politics, even though it's supposed to be the most politicized of the different communities. And the ir irony here is that uh, the two individuals from Toronto, well, one is originally from Alberta, but she lives in Toronto now, who have gone into the trenches of Canadian politics, who have Ukrainian background, Boris Jasnevsky and Christian Freeland, are both from the Plas Romada, not from the Sum Romada, which is you know, surprising because Plas is, um, is, is a community in Canada, America, which always sees itself as not political. Um, but nobody from the Sum Romada, which tends to prefer to just remain in charge of um, League of uh, Cook um, and these kind of organizations rather than going into the trenches of Canadian uh, federal politics. Um, there's also a question of ghettoization. Um, how can it be explained, for example, that um, although since the Euromaidan began, I've undertaken over 250, probably now close to 300 interviews for radio, TV and print media from outlets all across the world I've even written, written articles for Chinese publications. But I've never once, never once, been asked by Toronto's two Ukrainian TV channels to come on board to talk about the Euromaidan or to talk about the conflict in Ukraine. Maybe I don't exist for them. Or maybe I'm just not part of the club um, because I wasn't born in Canada. Um, again, it's difficult to understand um, why, why that's the case. The, um, we have the ability, because the majority of media outlets in North America are on the Ukraine side in this conflict with Russia over the Crimea and East Ukraine, and I think that's going to increase, not decrease, with reports coming out, su such as Amnesty International this week, talking about the separatists executing Ukrainian prisoners. So that sympathy for Ukraine is going to grow, not decline, and that's especially going to be the case when the US has a new president next year. Um, at the same time, we haven't got the people to write articles for newspapers and magazines and for blogs and for websites. Um, there are plenty of places that would take those articles, because with the internet era, there's a huge amount of um, sort of maybe not high-ranking publications, but others that are influential and would take articles. But in the whole of North America, there are only three to four people writing op-eds from the Ukraine diaspora. Two in the United States, Alexander Motil, who was extremely prolific and probably the most prolific person, and um, Adrian Karadnitsky, who we know um, a few years ago was shouting from the rooftops how good Viktor Yanukovych was, and now all of a sudden he's on the side of the Democrats in Ukraine. But nevertheless, those two do write publications. And it's one thing, you know, individuals who, who are experts on 18th century or 17th century Cossacks can maybe go to a TV station, a radio station, and give an interview, but they're not going to write articles about contemporary Ukraine. 
particularly because historians and people from the cultural sphere don't write articles for newspapers. That's more the field of political scientists. In Canada, there's just myself, who's not of Canadian background. Christian Freeland writes excellent op-eds, um, and I hope that one day she'll be the Foreign Minister of Canada. But, but she's constrained by being a politician in what she is, is allowed to write. So she's not able to, as it were, freely, um, as freely expose her views as maybe Motul, Karadinsky, and Kuzio. So there's a lot of work here that wasn't done, and it's ensured that we haven't been prepared for this massive onslaught. And let's remember it's part of a major onslaught. Hybrid war not only means um, countering and lying about having troops on the ground and training the separatists and sending them equipment. It's also part of cyber warfare, information warfare, bribing politicians in Europe, um, changing mindsets, and throwing doubt in. in and, and all of that is part of the arsenal of hybrid war, which we have to try and counter or help others to counter. Um, for example, on the current controversy surrounding the dismissal of the opera singer by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. Um, the, um, what has not been stated, I think, in my view, is that this is not just a question of free speech or not. If she was saying anti-Semitic items, if she was saying racist items against black people and against Chinese people, or if she was attacking Jews as an anti-Semite, nobody would be shouting from the rooftops Free speech, you should be allowed to say that. Um, that's the kind of arguments we should be making. And we should have our, already have our own people writing letters and, and rebuttals and op-eds um, and asking to go on radio stations saying that, you know, uh, that her views, although they're directed against Ukrainians, are as racist as if they were directed against black people or against Jews. Racism should not be tied to color or, or religion in that sense. Um, and this is more than just a question of, of, of free speech. Um, she is allowed to have her views, but she should keep them, um, she should be very circumspect. If you're a public figure, you have to be very circumspect in what you actually are able to say publicly, as I mentioned in the case of Christian Fielder. So this means that we have a lot of work to do. It means that um, the Cook and Ukraine organizations in the US need to invest in politics. It's as simple as that. They need to invest in journalism, they need to invest in people who can do PR. That means encouraging people to go into the political science field, in providing resources at the existing Ukrainian centers, such as what Ukrainian Studies Fund has done with Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, providing resources for individuals who can research contemporary Ukraine, who also then can write op-eds, who also then can appear on radio and TV. That, needs to, that requires conscious effort of investment. It means that in current institutions, whether it's Hewry, Columbia, Toronto, or, or Edmonton CIUS, need to broaden their horizons. Um, need to get out of their ivory towers and realize that we have to um, have a broader scope to what we understand as Ukrainian studies. It also means we need to encourage young Ukrainians living in Canada and the US to go into areas such as public relations, government communications, journalism, um, so, that, so that we will have a ready-made um, group of people who can work in this field. I'm not sure any of that's been done at the moment. One area is, which is very important is, of course, um, YouTube, um, video blogs. It is surprising how uh, the Ukrainian community is in some way so behind in this dealing with this social sphere. Why it doesn't recognize that Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube have such a massive influence on the public dimension today. Not everybody wants to read something. People want to watch as well as read. Um, and therefore, when individuals like William Schutz is actually doing various video blogs and has been doing it for a number of years, it's incredible to hear insinuations 
made against his character that he's paid by somebody. If only that was true. It's not. Sadly, it's not. Um, the criticism is more a, ref a reflection of, I would say, an inferiority complex. That somebody's doing something that's not actually um, being controlled or it's not actually being not part of the cook maybe agenda. It should be. I mean, all of these areas should be. I mean, I, I have probably one of the highest Twitter memberships in, in, out of the Ukraine diaspora in North America. I have two and a half thousand followers. Um, every time I send something out, it goes to them. I mean, all of these things have impact. Video blogs and Facebook. Um, we should be in that area, but it seems that we're quite old-fashioned in not, in not dealing with that. Um, and uh, institutions such as the Ukraine Studies Fund, which covers my grant for CIUS, or the Canadian Institute of Ukraine Studies, have not provided resources um, for this whole social sphere, um, for video blogs. Um, again, I wish that they, they would, but they, particularly the Canadian Institute of Ukraine Studies, being based in Alberta, is under financial constraints at the moment. The fall in the oil price is bad for Alberta and for Vladimir Putin. Um, so, so that could be a constraint upon them. But um, one should recognize individuals who are doing this kind of work voluntarily um, for, for, what, for um, YouTube and for video blogs with myself um, at, without receiving any remuneration. Um, what to me is, is extremely surprising is the degree to which Ukrainians in North America are not very influential in the two capital cities of North America, Ottawa and Washington. I mean, Washington should have been a target for North Americans because, of course, the U.S. is so important to Ukraine and to the international um, arena, um, but it never has. Um, this is a city with five private universities, tens of think tanks, IMF, World Bank, and, and yet, um, there is no um, established Ukrainian studies in, in Washington. It tends to be um, just occasionally people coming through, like I was visiting professor at George Washington University. Um, that would be an, an ideal location to target for, for that kind of thing. Same thing in Ottawa, but of course you know, Canada is not as influential as the US, but nevertheless, the same thing in Ottawa in terms of um, providing resources, say, to Carlton, where there is a pro-Russian lobby. There are academics who go to the Valdai Club to hear what Vladimir Putin has to say, and where they do teach on Eastern European and Ukrainian-Russian issues. Again, that would be an important place to, to invest. Um, Ottawa is more complicated because although Dominic Carell covers contemporary Ukraine, he's permitted Russia, Russophiles and Ukrainophobes such as Ivan Kachanovsky to be based at the University of Ottawa um, who has views on Ukrainian nationalism which could have been taken out of a Soviet ideological textbook and therefore um, until he deals with that problem I'm not sure that we should be investing into the chair of Ukraine studies University of Ottawa but there's a lot of areas that we need to do we need to prepare strategic plans as to what should be done it's too late to go into the past to reverse what we didn't do in the past, but we need to prepare strategic plans how to deal with politics and academia, journalism, public relations, government communications, um, reaching out, teaching people how to reach out and network. And it's not just a problem for the Ukrainian diasporas, by the way. The Ukrainian embassies and consulates here are hopeless in reaching out and networking with experts, journalists, and academics. But it's a product of that ghettoization, that, that provincialism that we don't feel comfortable. We, we prefer to stay in our own comfort zone and hence, um, in the case of Ukraine television in Toronto, to interview people from our own Kromada as opposed to reaching out to, to others. So the conflict in Ukraine is not going to go away. Vladimir Putin is reaching to his mid-60s. He's got Quite a bit of time left as president of Russia. As long as he's president of Russia, there's going to be conflict in eastern Ukraine. That means we have to prepare for the medium term um, how to counter Russian disinformation and propaganda. 
Until now, we've been doing a very bad job. Um, it's been reliant on a very small number of people. Um, it's time that we developed a strategic plan to take on Putin's lies and disinformation.